It's on. You're not hearing me? You are. I need to, I need to bring it in? Okay. Uh, yeah, you want to hear more of that, don't you? Well, our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and then be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. And, uh, so do not be astonished that what I have, uh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, and that is the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order so that the world might be saved through him. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word. Would you all pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, in this hour and in this place, I ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to the beloved in this house gathered today, O God, I ask that you challenge them, that you confront them, that you help them to see you in a different light than they've seen you before, all as your spirit moves among us all as we grow closer to you and to each other. For it is in your Son's name that we gather and pray. Amen. This is the famous story of Nicodemus and his encounter with Jesus. And I think it's a story that many of us, if not all of us, on some level or another can relate to. Nicodemus was a man of success and resource. What I mean by this is he did not live in fear, wondering where he would sleep that night or where his next meal would come from. He was a man who was educated. He had a successful career. And his career choice and plan that he followed in his father's footsteps, we could consider a white-collar type career. He was an educator. He was an expert. He was a priest. He was well-received and respected in his field of work, for he was elected to become a member of the Sanhedrin, the legal governing body of Judea. And he is a man of God, deeply involved in the workings of his church, which is the Temple of Jerusalem. He served on committees. He helped teach us how people could live a life with God, with every element of their life being one of worship. He had a vast knowledge of the Torah, and he knew how to apply it to his life. People looked up to Nicodemus and respected him, and he was mysteriously drawn to Jesus. 
I believe, as I said before, a lot of us are like Nicodemus, that we are also mysteriously drawn to him, but we don't always know why. Everyone here is in this hour of intentional worship because we are drawn to this Jesus of Nazareth, and we can't always tell each other, let alone ourselves, why. God's love, while we learn to become dependent on him, to receive him, it's a mystery in understanding the gift of this son, Jesus the Christ. This mysterious figure of Jesus was, has an attraction. It has a charisma. It has a magnetism that draws on our hearts and try as we might while Jesus attracts us to grow more deeply in our love of God. We, like Nicodemus, are oftentimes confused by Jesus, the teaching of his words, and the grace in his miraculous actions. To help clear up some of the confusion, Nicodemus came to Jesus under the cover of darkness at night. He was literally in the dark and figuratively in the dark because he had no idea what he was going to encounter. And in his conversation, he did not understand what Jesus was saying. They had this awesome chat, but I am not convinced that they totally and completely connected. As they talked, Nicodemus applied his intellect, his education, the values that his world had taught him to believe as ultimate truth in being in relationship with God. And because of this, Nicodemus, like ourselves at times, missed the point of what Jesus was telling him. Let go of what you know. Let go of what you believe and feel and are comfortable with that this world has taught you. And let me... Jesus, the Son of Man, show you the real truth of God's love. Now, I'm going to stop there for a minute and kind of explain where Nicodemus was coming from because we like to make a lot of assumptions. This man was probably knew about the old, more about the Old Testament than any of us ever will. You see, for men like Nicodemus, Pharisees, priests, they lived by a very complex system of rules of how to relate to God. It started with the Ten Commandments in the middle, or otherwise known as the Law of Moses. These are the rules that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai that they collected and embraced and lived throughout their entire lives. These ten. But in time, they began to recognize that if we truly want to be one with God, if we truly want to be as holy as possible, we have to put a barrier between ourselves and these Ten Commandments so we don't come close to violating them. Because if we live by the simple Ten Commandments, how often is it to violate them on a daily basis? How often do we not put God first? How often are we jealous of what someone else has? How often do we appropriate something that we probably shouldn't? It's very simple. In violating those, you separated yourselves from God because if you broke these rules, you were committing a sin. No. So they created an explanation of the Ten Commandments known as the written. The written law. This is what Jews primarily call Talmud. And there's a number of different Talmuds written. These were expositions, explanations that were in length and detail that would separate you from these ten so you'd never come close to violating them. Well, as time went on, the written law wasn't enough. So they wrote, well, they created a third barrier. And this was, does anyone know what this one was called? Anyone take a guess? As soon as I say it, it's going to come to you. This one was the oral law. Hey, now you know it, right? <laughs> a set of teachings and another edition of expositions that for a number of centuries were not written down. They were passed down word of mouth, rabbi to community, father to son. If you add up all of this in the Ten Commandments, you have over 630 different laws that you had to follow. And they were all in place by the time Nicodemus was around. They explained 
everything about life. What did work look like? What did play look like? What did a healthy marriage look like? What did a healthy lifestyle look like? What did it mean to be a prominent member of society? And if you didn't follow these, how could you possibly receive God's blessing? Nicodemus was a man who was educated and respected in his community. He was looked upon as someone who had received God's blessing. He was an expert in doing all of this. And he was asking Jesus, how can this be? He's asking out of the traditions that have been laid down by countless generations, thousands of years, because this is how, in the Jewish mindset, when Jesus came into the world, and to Jews today, that you related to God. 631 laws. I don't know about you, but the top 10 is hard enough for me, let alone the other 621 that go on top of that. With that in mind, I'm going to continue. Jesus represented a way, the ways of God that were, by definition to all Jewish human logic, unconventional. They were unconventional. They were hard to understand. It was hard to, be, to get this for someone like Nicodemus. And I think the smarter we are, the more educated we are, the more we are truly children of the culture around us and the ethics that guide us, when we hear God, Jesus saying, you know, turn the other cheek, that's a hard thing to wrap our head around. And it was a hard thing for Nicodemus to get his head wrapped around. Because in his eyes, what he came to Jesus with was conventional thinking, and Jesus was giving unconventional thinking. If someone hits me and I hear Jesus saying, turn the other cheek, my initial reaction isn't to go here. My initial reaction is to put you down, because you get one shot, and that's it. That's what my upbringing taught me. That's what my father taught me. That's what my grandfather taught me. You make sure you're the one who stands when the fight's over. Jesus had an unconventional reaction to an action of violence. His way of responding is very inconsistent for what I was taught. And it's hard for me sometimes to connect with Jesus because what he teaches is so different from what I know, what I believe to be true, what I have been taught all my years. Jesus also says to love your neighbor, and you know, you've heard it said that you need to love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but Jesus says to love our enemies as well. So I need to love the bloke that just took a shot at me, the guy that I want to put down. Does that make sense? We have a system of justice that when something is done to us, you stand before judgment and then some type of atonement is levied against you, whether it's a fine or a time that you have to pay or some type of action of community service. But Jesus is going beyond all of that. The system of justice is logical to us, but Jesus is not. My enemy I should treat as my friend? That's hard. It's difficult teaching, and I have a difficult time understanding it. I have a difficult time living it, not because it's difficult for me to hear and accept. It's because in my heart of hearts, I really don't want to. I want to hold on to my anger. I want to hold on to my pain. I want to use it as an energy to grind that individual into a pulp. Jesus is saying... Love your neighbor, hate. Love your, love your enemy. That's hard. In the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus, Jesus is saying things in a very simplistic fashion, and they're very hard for Nicodemus to understand. You must be born again. Or as other English translations put it, you must be born anew or born from above. Now, the original Greek for this particular text, um, this is a flexible phrase. 
And how it is written is how the interpreter applies it to the situation. The word actually has a few different meanings. And the meaning is defined by the context. Being Americans who have a, very, who have a language of precision, this is a very difficult concept for us to wrap our heads around. But it basically means born again, born anew, born from above. In other words, you need to let go of who you are and allow yourself to become something totally and completely new. And Nicodemus didn't get it. Why? Because he came from a religious and cultural background that taught because you were born a Jew. You were automatically a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You were already, since you were of the chosen people of God, in God's graces. You were automatically going to receive the blessing. Why would you need to cast that aside and allow God to guide you into a new journey? Well, because the people weren't having an individual relationship with God. You see, with this style of religion that the Jews were practicing, they could have their little lessons at synagogue and temple throughout their villages. But if they really wanted to feel close to God, where did they have to go? The temple of Jerusalem, where they did sacrifice. Taking their sin and commuting it into the animal, which would then be slain, the blood would be spilled, the body would be burned, and the sin would be destroyed. That's how the slate got wiped clean. And Jesus is doing away with all that. Where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the final sacrifice. In the way that Moses raised the serpent to save the people who were sick in the desert so many years ago when they were wandering, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up, and you can all look upon him, raised up upon the cross with his blood, with his blood shed so all of our sins can be washed away. He took that burden on himself. Jesus is taking this entire model that Nicodemus has known and breaking through it. Because this model separated God from coming into the hearts of his people, the hearts of people of the world. Jesus was the vessel that made that possible. He didn't come to do away with Judaism. He didn't come away to destroy their way of life. He came to give it new meaning. We can read the Ten Commandments and the Talmud, the oral and the written laws. And we can go, wow, this is a wonderful moral code. But when we have a relationship with our God, the words of that moral code now come to life. Stalin read the Bible every day as a source of history. But when I read it as a child of God, having come to God through the Son, Jesus the Christ, these words become alive. It's not merely a story in the history of God's movement in the world. It's how God is guiding me to move in this world. But I have to let go of being John and Carolyn's son. Paul and Naomi, Otto and Ruth's grandson. I have to let go of the joy and pride that I have in my blue-collar upbringing. The issues that I had growing up with a handicapped sister. The struggles that I have with my own wife's health issues. My own cotton-picking sinus infection that I have right now. I have to let go of all of that and allow Jesus to take me on the journey to become something else. Something completely foreign and different from what the world I grew up in told me I am supposed to be. I find it interesting in schools now, they have this thing called career cruising, where they take a couple of days and through periodic times throughout the academic lifetime of a student, they assess them to see what their career path should be. Now, when I was my son's age, he's 13 now, and he just went through it, they probably would have told me I would have been a great tradesman because I didn't really engage too much in the educational process. I found it boring and pedantic. It's not that I didn't find interest in the subjects. I just didn't see the point in putting forth effort. I give thanks that my son's not that way. 
Oh, yeah. When I run into some of my old teachers of the past, Paul, what are you doing now? Well, I'm a pastor. Really? <laughs> and it's not because I was a particular hellion. I wasn't. Well, I was the guy that didn't get caught. Uh, but that's a different story for another day. They based it on the work that I gave them in the classroom. They judged me before they knew me. I sit there and I look at the work that my son's doing in the school right now, and I go, you know, that's a guide, that's an idea. But I know that if God has a different plan for my son and what those results put forward, and if my son gives himself to God totally and completely, he's going to blow everybody's mind away. He's 13. What does he know that he wants to be? I don't know yet. When he knows, he'll let me know. When God knows, he'll let us know. But if I were to stick to the conventional wisdom that's being put forward that this career cruising will pretty much map out my son's academic career from now until the end of college, then he's going to be a comedian or a magician or a music teacher or he's going to, he's going to create computer games. I see more within my son than that. I think he's pretty funny, but I don't think he'll make any money at it. I am waiting for God to break through the barriers of my son and show him what his path would be. Every time I come to the scriptures, I open myself for God to break through the barriers to show me what I should become. When Nicodemus went to Jesus, he was showing him how he was breaking through all the barriers of the society to say, let me show you the truth of my Father's love. Let me explain to you what is really happening. The Messiah that you've been waiting for for over a thousand years is now here, and Nicodemus didn't get it. He knew too much. He learned to trust all the things that had been put into his mind. He didn't bother to sit back and say, God, what's next? How should I grow? How should I be different? In a church that I served with a number of years ago, it was a congregation that had gone through a lot of change. They had two bodies worshiping in the same church, and they were constantly in conflict with each other. You had the people who could trace their lineage of the church back over 100 years. The church was 137 years old at the time. And then you had those who had been worshiping in the past five. The ones for the past 130-whatever wanted to keep doing things the way they were done 137 years ago. But you had this new body that saw the movement of Christ differently. And they wanted a worship environment, a church environment that would reflect that. Well, in time, I figured out who the leaders of these two factions were. And I would talk with them from time to time, asking the same question. Tell me where God is calling you to come together. How is God asking you, Mr. Tradition, to kind of take a step forward into the contemporary, and you, Mr. Contemporary, to be patient for him to catch up. And on this particular Sunday morning, there was an explosion in my office, a shouting match, faces bright red, words of umbrage spewing out. And I'm sitting there going, where is my Kevlar vest? It was scary. I'd never seen two Christians who say they love Jesus so much have so much rancor towards each other. This was a communion Sunday. And I said, you know, guys, we're not going to resolve this. You go that way, get a drink of water. You go that way, get a drink of water. I need a few minutes to get my game helmet on and do worship. And at least they respected that. Now, in this church, when they, did in, when they do communion, they did it with intinction. And if you're here for the Ash Wednesday service, well, we took the bread, dipped it in the juice, and then partake in it. But this church did it a little differently. And it was really neat. When you would approach the bread, you would tear off a piece and give it to the person immediately behind you, saying, 
this is the body of Christ, broken for you. You took the moment of your relationship with God and shared it with the person immediately behind you. A statement of welcoming, a statement of coming together, a statement of building community. Well, worship began, did my prayers, we sang our hymns, I went through the teaching, it was time for communion, the people are coming around the sides of the sanctuary, coming up to the front, and who do I see? Tradition, contemporary, one in front of the other. They didn't know where they were. They were too busy chit-chatting with their friends, talking to their kids. One was talking to their grandchildren, getting ready. And as they came up, you know, the traditional guy was given his bread. He dipped, he put it in his mouth. He tore off a piece of bread, turned around, and who did he see? The man he did not understand and the man he would love to have driven out of his church. My traditionalist friend looks at the bread, he looks up at the cross, then he looked at me, and I really wanted to go, but I didn't. I stood there going, oh my Lord, what's going to happen? And then he closed his eyes. Now I don't know what happened inside of his mind. I don't know what his wrestling match was. I don't know what his words were. But I could see the look of agony on his face. So I assume it was some type of internal struggle within himself. I pray between he and God. By this time, the rest of the congregation knows what's going on. This stop has stopped, has stopped moving, and they're all looking over to see what's going to happen. You could have dropped a pin in that room. Even the baby stopped crying. And eventually the traditionalist gave the piece of bread to the contemporary, saying, this is the body of Christ, broken for you so you may be part of this body. A lot of hard growing started to happen after that. They started to communicate. But in that moment, the wind blew. Jesus talks about the wind blows. The Ruach, the Spirit of God. The wind blew in that moment. And the brokenness, the barriers, the rules, the conceptions, the ideas, the prejudices, whatever it was that was keeping these two separated, keeping that traditionalist from appreciating what this man was bringing, this group was bringing, broke through. And the body grew. He could have walked away. He could have made a scene. He could have rejected not serving that man and went and served someone else. But the wind blew. And it changed his heart. It changed his mind. Was he on board with what the contemporary people were bringing? No. What did he recognize? This is where the future of the church was moving because he recognized his way was going to die with him. That's the only conversation we got out of that. I got out of it. I asked him, how did you know? That's what you needed to do. And he said, I just knew. I just knew that it was right. I said, has anyone asked you? He says, I've been asked a lot. But it was just what God wanted me to do. And in that moment, I knew. Nicodemus was being offered an invitation to become part of something bigger than his 631 rules. He was being invited to be part of a movement of God's love that was going to survive far beyond the temple period. Far beyond the conventional thinking of Jerusalem. He was being invited to be part of a church movement that would change the face of the world because it wouldn't be localized on just one chosen people of God, but the entire world of the messengers who took it out. But 
But in this conversation and in this moment, Nicodemus didn't get it. My question for us is as we move forward during this time of Lent, you know, some folks say, oh, it's a time to give something up. Well, when you give something up, that time that you devote to that thing, you should give to God in prayer. For the others, it's like, it's a time for God to mold me and change me, and they find some study that either supports what they believe and just renews it, or they take something that is different from what they're accustomed to and allow themselves to be challenged. For body of Christ, I think Lent is the time to take everything that we know, everything that we believe, everything that we've embraced, and simply do this. Give it to God and see what God does with it. The answer and response will not be immediate. That's why Lent is so many Sundays, because it's a journey, and today we begin it. Well, last Sunday we begin it. Today we focus on it. The question is, what will the new life be when Easter comes? How will we view God differently? How will we worship with our brothers and sisters differently? How will we serve differently? How will we love differently? How will we love our enemies differently, those that we have denied God's love? How will we forgive ourselves of things that we've done? How will we forgive others of things that they have done? How, 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 how? I don't know. But I know that God broke through the barriers through his son. And we will wrestle with that. Not just in a Lenten journey, but throughout our whole Christian journey. And can I let you in a little secret? It's okay. A Christian who comes to me and says, I have the Christian faith all figured out, scares the bajitas out of me. Because they believe their journey is a fixed, finite idea. But God is growing and developing us, using our gifts and abilities in different times, in different places, and they will reap different results. Nick wanted to take God, take Jesus, and fit him into these 631 rules. And Jesus was saying, you can't put my God in a box. We can't put the Savior in a formula. All we can do is take who we are and put it at the cross and say, Jesus, take me and use me as you will. And then trust God to take care of the rest. But between now and that time when it comes, when we have that revelation, that realization, we need to be paying attention to what God is doing around us. How is God challenging the barriers that we embrace, that we are stopping the Spirit coming in. We need to be paying attention to the movement of the Spirit, the inkling, the challenges, the little buzzing in the back of your mind. Is that God talking to you, saying, hey, I got an idea? I need you to think about something, chew on it? We need to keep our eyes and ears open because the wind is going to blow. It's going to blow, and it's going to do something beautiful and powerful. And if we are able to take notice of it, then we are able to experience it and realize that that is a day of new birth. That is a day when the Spirit is giving us a gift from above. Nick went to Jesus with some preconceived notion. But we shouldn't. Every time we go to Jesus, we should be paying attention. Will you pray with me, please? Loving God, take us on a journey that will blow our minds. Take us on a journey that will renew us, that will empower us, that will enable us to discover ministries that are maybe beyond our comprehension at this moment, but with all things being possible through you and all things being good, help us to recognize it, to follow it, and to enjoy it. For you are not only the source of love, you are the source of joy. 
Fill us, guide us, challenge us in these days ahead. And allow us to continue to know that you are a God who loves us and cares for us and really wants to be one with us. Because you gave us your son. And in his, his name we come. Amen.